Hey y'all, when it comes to accessorizing my Gatton CNC, the next item on the list is a set of these. Homing and limit switches. Yes, homing and limit switches. Yes, me. I know, right? Yeah, well, no, trust me, it's gonna be fine. Just come along for the ride, it'll be fine. I'm gonna take a moment to talk about the switches and the wire that I'm using for my limit switches. Now, this switch here is typical micro switch. Got a little roller on the end here. And these are rated for uh, three to 16 amps, up to 250 volts AC. We're gonna be running five volts DC through it, so there's more than enough capacity in these switches to handle what we're doing. And I'm gonna get up here by the lens, if I can keep it in frame, see if you can, if it'll focus on that. The switch is marked down here on the bottom terminal, uh, COM for common. Then this leg here is uh, normally open, and the leg up here on top is normally closed. And they're marked NC and NO. Now we're gonna run a normally closed circuit, meaning that there's going to be five volts DC running through it in its normal untriggered condition. When the switch reaches the stop and activates, it'll cut power to the circuit and that's what'll signal Mach 3 to stop driving along that axis. When, it, when we're able to back off of that switch so it disengages, then Mach 3 will go ahead and take over and we can run them again. The reason I'm gonna go for the normally closed circuit as opposed to the normally open is because there's that added little bit of safety feature in there in that if a wire gets pulled loose or if a wire breaks or if a short happens, it will immediately trigger a limit switch and that axis won't move. So we know we have something we need to investigate, find out what's going on. If we were to run this in a normally open circuit where there's no power going through the system, if a wire breaks, comes loose, or a short develops somewhere, we wouldn't know it until the uh, axis crashed into its stop. And by then it may be too late. So by running a normally closed circuit on this, with five volts DC running through it, we have that extra layer of safety. So uh, I'll put a link in the description box below to these switches. Uh, they're available individually, packs of six, packs of 10, packs of 25. It so happens that when I went to order these, I needed, technically I only needed five for my system, but I w when I went to order a package of six, a pack of 25 was on sale for the same price. So I went ahead and got the 25. I'll use these in other applications. Can never have too many of these little buggers floating around. Plus, you know, if I damage one, I've got a backup. But uh, those are the switches. As far as the wire is concerned, this is what I originally bought. Now I got this at my local home center and it was advertised as four conductor, meaning four separate wires inside the cable, shielded cable, stranded wire, 22 gauge. And when I got it home, I discovered not only are they solid conductors instead of stranded, but they're also not shielded. It's just standard insulation, no shielding at all. I want shielded cable to block uh, potential RF interference. Now the router I'm running, my Porter Cable 890, is a standard motor which runs brushes. And if you are running a brushed motor, you will have RF interference. That's just all there is to it. I'm also running some funky old fluorescent lights, which I will be replacing down the road. But for right now, my main concern is that router motor and any other motors that I run here, uh, sanders or what have you, could possibly interfere with the uh, operation of my switches. 
and potentially trigger false limits. What I had to order and ended up going with was this cable. It is two conductor, which is technically all I need, meaning that there are two wires in the cable. But if you take a look, this is actually stranded wire the way it should be. If you're going to have any kind of movement at all, at all in the system, you need stranded wire. Because eventually, with movement, this solid core uh, stress fractures, you know, repeated bending and unbending of the uh, wire, eventually it's going to break. This is, the stranded cable is a lot more resilient. It's not going to break as easily. It still may break, but not as easily as that solid core. Also, this cable, as you can see, is shielded. So, this is the cable that I needed in the first place, and this is the cable I ended up ordering and getting. So this is what I'm going to use on this system. Okay, here in a prop is the layout I'm going to use for wiring my limit switches. Now, I'm not going to be using this wire. This is just for demonstration purposes only. So the way I have my limit switches mounted on the each axis, which you'll see here in a couple of minutes, they're close enough together that I can wire these in series without long runs of uh, unshielded cable. So I'll have a switch at one end of the axis and a switch for the other end of the axis. Now I'm going to be wiring these in series, which means that it's going to be basically one loop. The positive cable will come in off of the breakout board carrying 5 volts DC into the normally closed leg on the switch up here. Then this jumper wire will connect this common on this switch to the common on this switch. And the negative lead in the cable will be connected to the normally closed pole or leg on this end of the switch and run down to the ground on the breakout board. This is a series type connection. I'm not going to run them parallel. This is the simplest way to go and it'll work for me. Now in the case of my z-axis, I'm not going to be running a, a lower limit switch for several reasons that I'll get into later. So in that case, I'll only have one switch on my z-axis. I will then run it where I have the positive running straight into the normally closed leg of the switch and the negative running straight off of the common. That's the only difference in the way these switches are going to be wired. And the Z axis is going to be the only one wired this way. The X and the Y will be wired in series like this. So the first order of business was to go ahead and run all that cable through the small drag chain up on top of the Z axis. And of course, also feeding it through that smaller drag chain that runs across the top of the gantry. Then I fed it through the clamps that I had mounted to the end of my channel and routed it down towards the drag chain for the y-axis. Feeding that cable through the y-axis drag chain was probably the easiest part. Okay, we're underneath the table now. And uh, you can probably make out right here in front of me, bolted down to the bottom is a terminal block. And this terminal block is where I'm going to end all of my common slash ground wires. 
Now on this side, I have a ground wire that runs down to the ground on the breakout board inside the enclosure right here. On this side, all these terminals are open. Every one of these is for a ground slash common wire. So I've got my cable pulled down here. I'm going to route it, secure it up here, then connect the black wire here, my wire coming off of the common on my limit switch into this terminal right here. So all of my grounds on the entire CNC system will run through this ground on the terminal block right here. Then I will carry on with the red wire, the power wire, down inside the enclosure to the appropriate terminal on the breakout board for this switch on my Z-axis. Now connecting the wires to the limit switches themselves was very simple. I simply separated the wires out of the cable, put a female crimp-on type spade terminal on each of those wires, and then connected them to the limit switches. Now you'll notice in this shot, I still have the two limit switches for the Z-axis. I later changed my mind and ran with just the single limit switch on the Z-axis as I described earlier in the video. And after finishing the Z limit switch and the X limit switch, I moved on to the Y limit switches. Okay, so here I am back underneath the table and I've got some cable going here. I'm ready to wire from the terminal block where I cut down the wires that I ran from the individual switches. I'm going to connect up the positive uh, wires out of this cable and run it down inside the enclosure here. Now I'm going to do something that's a little bit counterintuitive and you might think, uh-oh, this is a big mistake. And, you know, maybe it will turn out to be so, but uh, I don't think it will. And that is basically, I'm trying to keep as much shielded cable going here as I possibly can. Yeah, coming through the jungle. I'm trying to keep as much shielded cable running here as I possibly can. So, uh, to that end, what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect up the red wire on this cable to the red wire for my z-axis then the black wire from this cable to the red wire on my x-axis yeah I know I'm changing uh, color codes uh, the main reason is I want to use both of the uh, conductors in this piece of cable and I don't have enough here left over to run three separate cables from up here down to there. Now remember, this is all sharing one ground, uh, and the reason for that is the ground connection on the uh, breakout board is very small. It won't handle four separate wires or more coming into it. So I have one wire running from this terminal block down to the ground, and all of the grounds from the uh, from my touch plate and the limit switches run up to this terminal block. So. Again, I'm going to hook the red positive to the Z. The black will become the positive to the X. And then with the leftover wire that I have, I'll be able to run the Y positive on the red from up here where it's terminated down into the enclosure. So let me get going on it.
Now I'll take the heat gun to these two connections, or to the, these connections here, shrink down that heat shrink, then get some staples and clamps going to secure these to where they're not in danger of getting yanked loose. So now I can guesstimate how much I'm going to need to run to the breakout board and run that into the back of the enclosure. Okay, now clamp these up and I'm set. Back underneath the table here, and what we're looking at is the breakout board right here. You've got a plug right here in your way so you can't see the this red cable, maybe you can. This red cable right here is the positive from my triple edge finder. That's plugged into pin 13. The one next to it is pin 12. The one next to that is pin 11. And you would think that they would go sequentially, but they don't, because way down here, second from the end, is pin 10. Now remember, we've only got a few inputs. Some of these pins are reserved for inputs, some are reserved for outputs. So the way I'm going to put this together is pin 11, which is this one right here, will be my x-axis, pin number 12 will be my z-axis, and then down here pin number 10 will be my y-axis. That's how I'm going to wire these. So let me go ahead and get this wire stripped and we'll go ahead and get those hooked up. Okay, now, all that's left to do, clamp and staple this wiring down so that it doesn't accidentally get ripped out of here by some ham-fisted guy like me. <laughs> so that's where I'm going to leave this video right here. I'm trying to avoid another 30-minute epic. So in the next episode, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll get into Mach 3, we'll get all the settings put in, we'll configure the switches, we'll do everything that we need to do to get this up running and have active working limit switches on all three axes and homing switches on all three axes. So that's where we're at right now. Now, if you got anything at all out of this video, I do hope you'll give me a thumbs up down there. And if you want to follow along with my adventures in accessorizing and adjusting my Gatton CNC, consider subscribing to my channel. Now, whether you subscribe to me or not, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video, and y'all take care.